Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode, Jack and I talk with Old West Investment Management CIO and Portfolio Manager Joe Boscovich about the firm's long-term investment orientation, what they look for when buying a stock, and how they think about building a portfolio with market-beating potential. One of the main criteria they look for is a company and management doing things that are good for shareholders, and that is thinking like long-term owners of the business. We explore this idea and many other important ideas relating to long-term successful investing throughout the discussion. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Old West Joe Boscovich. Hi, Joe. How are you? Thank you for joining us today. I'm doing well. Thank you. We're going to talk about uh, Old West investing philosophy, how uh, you've been inspired by some great investors such as Ben Grant and others. Uh, we want to um, talk through with you your investing process, how your portfolio managers go about selecting companies and the different ways that you guys build investment strategies over there. So that's going to be um, the core of the discussion today. But before we get into all that, I wanted just to ask you, there was something that jumped out at me that was very interesting about your background. Uh-huh. And that is before you got into asset management, you had built a successful uh, produce and I think food distributor type of company. So I just thought it was an interesting background. And you know, I'd like to hear that story a little bit and how you transitioned from that business to where you are today. Sure. Well, my family has farmed in California for over 100 years. And uh, my grandfather, then my dad and uncles, um, I never intended on going into it. Um, But between undergraduate and graduate business school, I took a temporary job. Uh, My dad and my uncles, and uh, it lasted over 20 years. And uh, we built a big company, a farm 15,000 acres in California, Arizona, Mexico. Uh, But I always intended on doing what I'm doing today. So I was in my mid forties and I, and I asked myself the question, I mean, if you're going to do it, you better do it now. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I did it successfully. Um, so I'm actually really lucky to have done two things in my life that have both been great, very fulfilling. Um, but really they're both running businesses, you know, and, and, uh, and you see that all the time. You'll see somebody jump from pharmaceuticals to, to manufacturing, um, the, you know, you know, business is business. Right. And, um, and so, uh, but yeah, I've had two great careers and, um, and I'm loving what I'm doing and, and I've been doing this for over 20 years now and having a lot of fun. Very, very neat. I think. And correct me if I'm wrong here. I think one of the things with a family business that's multi multi generation is it sort of forces you to think long term. You're the business owner. Um, you're trying to build the business and add value. And so, would you say w- what other things do you think in terms from building that business um, that you can relate to sort of what you're doing today at Old West? Well, clearly, I mean it. it uh, you know. Um, a lot of people that do what I do now, they're, you're buying and selling stocks all day. And, and uh, we just have a complete different look at it. We're, we're buying companies um, and selling companies. And, um, and I think the other thing that differentiates us is we, just, we really have a lot of emphasis on management. And having run a company before, I know how important management is. And, um, and so it's, uh, we, we really spend a lot of time um, looking at the people that run the company, um, I can tell you that because I ran a, I ran a big company. There's that, uh, Graham quote on your site, investing is most intelligent when it is most businesslike. And that's one of the things that, you know, Graham really sort of drove home and, you know, Buffett continues to talk about that extensively today. Um, but do you want to sort of talk to, I mean, we, we just talked about that, but you know, is there anything else there that you think is worth flushing out? Uh, no. I, I think that it, it, it is, that's exactly uh, the idea, although it's easier said than done, you know, when you're, when you're working on a day-to-day basis and you're in the weeds, it's really hard to, to, to look at the entire company, the entire investment. And I, but I, you know, when you, we, when you invest in something and I mean, I, I hate to quote Buffett because everybody does, but you know, what's the ideal holding time for a, for a stock? And he said forever. And, uh, and I, so when we invest in a company, 
uh, we, that's our attitude is we're, we're, once we've done our due diligence, we think it's a worthwhile investment. Um, it's not for a week or a month. It's, it's, it's hopefully for a long time, unless something changes. Do you, do you have anything you do to try to detach yourself from like the day-to-day market? Because that's something I struggle with a lot too, is, you know, we're really valuing businesses and we're investing in businesses, but we're seeing all this craziness, you know, on a day-to-day basis, movement in stock prices. Like, do you have anything you do to try to keep yourself aligned with the business and, and separate yourself from what's going on day to day? Yeah, well, it's it's really hard um, to to separate yourself from the noise, and you know, and everybody's watching the same shows on TV, the same business media, reading the same things. So the the group think is just it's just horrible. It's horrible. It's always been bad. Um, I guess one good thing is we're about as far from New York as you can get being on, on the West Coast. That's probably helpful. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's almost a full-time job, uh, staying away from group bank. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about this idea of, you know, flows mattering more than fundamentals in the market. And that's kind of something that people are talking about is like where the flows are going in, obviously there's more demand. That's almost more important than the fundamentals. I'm guessing that's not something that you agree with and maybe the advantage that investors like you have is, you know, by taking that long-term perspective, it doesn't really matter what the short-term flows are because it's, you know, about the longest time period possible for you guys. Well, this all, this goes back to the whole, um, active versus passive, right. And, and the move to passive investing, which has just exploded, right. Uh, since the great recession. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that just, especially in the large cap space, it's like, why would you ever hire an active manager and pay him their fee when you can buy the market and, and do better for, for 10 bips? Um, yeah, I, I, I just, uh, it really plays into our hands really well, that, that idea. Uh, you know, you, when you buy an index and, you know, everybody owns the same stocks and, and uh, but, you know, no one is, is, is staying up until midnight reading the 10K and, and digging into the weeds. So, so there's really, uh, I, I think this is just opportunity uh, for active management today. Uh, right when everybody thinks passive is the way to go. I'm telling you, when I see everybody on the same side of the boat, I always go to the other side all by myself. And, uh, and, and so there's the, the move to passive is, is massive. Um, the opportunity for active investing today has probably never been greater, maybe ever. Do you think it requires more patience from people like us who use fundamentals? Because if you think about it, if like flows are going to these index funds and they're maybe inflating certain stocks, you know, relative to their fundamentals, if that goes on for a long period of time, you can have these periods where it just seems like fundamentals don't matter. I mean, do you think we have to lengthen our timeframes as fundamental investors and be more patient because of this? Uh, it requires a lot of patience. It really does. And, uh, but I, I, I think, you know, and it, it's hard, it's really hard, uh, you know, when you see value and nobody else sees it, when you're waiting for the market to come to you, um, and a lot of the things that we invest in, uh, you know, are, 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 are nobody. I'll give you one example. We invested in uh, uranium mining companies six years ago. And when we did that, people thought we were crazy. It's like we did the work nuclear was so scary. Uh, how funny that six years later, it's just ubiquitous, the feeling about nuclear energy. Oh, it's, it's even the Sierra Club endorses it. Everybody loves it now. Um, but six years ago, when we first put on the trade, uh, you know, it was very lonely uh, for a couple of years until uh, until the crowd came to us. Um, that's the kind of spot when you're ahead of the crowd and you're in there for you know for at, a, at your cost basis is is a fraction of what it is today. It's really where you want to be. You mentioned the importance of management before, and you know we're quant investors, and so for us, management only impacts us to the extent that it show, what they're doing shows up in the fundamentals. So I'm always interested in talking to people who have a better idea of getting their arms around like how good what good management looks like. And and you talk about this idea of you know management being aligned with you as a shareholder being one of the most important parts of your process. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about what what are the things you look at specifically to to make sure that's true. Well, when when a new idea comes before us, the the first thing we do is look at the proxy and the proxy is going to show us, you know, two critical items and it's going to be, um, the level of ownership of insiders and how they pay themselves. And the magic combination is very high ownership and very modest compensation. 
where they have more to gain from their ownership in the company than they do their paycheck. Uh, and within, I mean, within minutes, we can decide whether it requires a further look or not. Uh, but if it passes that first test, uh, then you sit there and say, okay, we have something here. And they're, they're not easy to find. Uh, you know, uh, but when you see them, uh, yeah, you know, I, I can show you examples of executives. You know, they're sometimes take no compensation. They take no compensation because their ownership is so great. And, um, and so our eyes just get really big when we see that. And that, then we just dig deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, typically, you want to see a track record of success. Um, and um, over the years, many examples of that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, the, the, the sweet spot would be uh, more to gain from your ownership than, than, your, than your paycheck. I'm just curious, if you look back towards the beginning of your career versus now, do you see, is that more of a problem now? Like are, are less management teams aligned with shareholders? Are less management teams like taking that very little compensation and completely aligning themselves with their investors? It's been a problem for a long time. It's, it's nothing new. It's been, it's been a problem for a long time. Um, you know, it's everybody's, I mean, who doesn't want a, a short-term uh, success, right? That's just human nature to get to point A to point B, the, the quickest, fastest way possible is human nature. So no, um, it, it goes against human nature. And, uh, and so it's always, it's always been an issue. You referenced insider ownership before. Is there, is there any other way? And I, I saw on your website, you guys are, you know, decent users of insider data. Is there any other way you think it's valuable? Like if insiders are aggressively buying right now, that that's good. Or if it's, if they're selling, it's a red flag. I mean, do you use it in any other ways besides looking for high levels of ownership? Well, we, 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 so we monitor every form for filing for every company every day. Uh, we're looking at, at every, every transaction for all four to 5,000 public yield companies every day. Um, so on for significant purchases, um, that's a screen, a starting point, um, for significant selling, um, uh, if we own the company, um, sirens go off and, uh, if we don't own the company, um, a potential short candidate. I know you want to talk about shorting at some point, uh, yeah, but we have two, we run long only separate accounts where there works, you know, no shorting. We also have, um, three LPs that we run where we can short and we do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, uh, we, 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 it's all good, important information and we look at all of it. Some of it's meaningful, a lot of it's not. Going back to the, uh, the idea of management, you know, one of the things you've talked about in some of the things I read. Uh, preparing for this is the idea that capital allocation is one of the most important things a management team can do. And, you know, the great management teams are, are exceptional at capital allocation. And I'm just wondering, what are you looking at when, when you look at a management team and you look at what they're doing with capital allocation, what are the key things you're looking at? So you, they have five choices, right? And I, I've yet to come up with a sixth on capital allocation. Um, they can reinvest in the company and grow it organically, or you can buy other companies you can pay down debt, you can pay a dividend, and you can buy back your stock. Um, I, if you find number six, let me know what it is. But anyway, uh, so those are the five choices. And when you're a, a huge owner of the company yourself, you're probably not gonna make a stupid acquisition. Uh, you're just for growth's sake. That's gonna have to make sense. Um, there was actually a great, great uh, example recently uh, in the mine, in the gold mining space, and we 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 are gold mining and in, uh, investors. And uh, Newcrest Mining from Australia was on the market, and uh, Newmont bought the company for I think nineteen billion. Uh, Mark Bristow, who runs Bear, looked at it, and he said, "I can't make sense of valuation." Uh, we're not a better. Uh, interesting that at Newmont, the executives own virtually no stock. Uh, Bristow is a very large shareholder of Barrick. And here's the guy that is a big owner that sat there and said, I can't make sense of it. The people that run the company that own virtually very little stock were happy to do it. And that's a classic example. I mean, they're wanting to grow for growth's sake. Versus in that, versus the guy over here that sits there and says, it's too expensive. I can't do it. Um, and so that would be on the, on, on the, on the, 
you know, buying other company inside of it, buying back your own stock. Most companies are horrible at buying back their own stock. Horrible. Um, if you went back to, um, after the bubble of 2000, 2001, no one's buying back their own stock. They were buying, they were buying it back in 98, 99. You go back into the great recession and nobody bought back their own stock in, in 09 and 10, but everybody's buying back their stock in eight and nine. So, um, so companies in general are horrible at buying back their own stock. Not the great, not the great asset allocator. The great asset allocators are buying their stock hand over fist when it's cheap. And, uh, um, so that would be a difference there, uh, paying down debt. You know, I mean, uh, there's times, uh, when interest rates are, are rising where it makes a lot of sense paying a dividend, buying back stocks. So I, I think that, um, the, the point is when you make these decisions, if your own money is on the line as an owner of the company, you're probably going to make a better decision than an executive that really doesn't have much skin in the game. Yeah, on your point about buying back stock, you know, one of the things we've seen a lot in, in the market recently is, you know, a lot of managements are you know, issuing shares to themselves and then the company's buying back stock. So, you know, to your point, there's a lot of different types of buybacks. I mean, there's buybacks at a cheap price done properly, and then there's buybacks to wash, you know, share issuance. So I'm sure it's really important to dig into the details to see what's going on. Absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, no, it's been the, the, the share issuance to executives has, has been egregious for a long time. Um, and of course, that's why everybody adjusts earnings, right? Nobody looks at gap earnings anymore. And, uh, uh everybody, every, it's, uh, it's actually amazing to me that the entire industry talks about adjusted earnings. Everybody talks about it. No one talks about gap earnings anymore. Um, what's the major adjustment in adjust earnings? Backing out stock based compensation. It's almost fraudulent. And, uh, that they let, let these executives get away with this. Um, and adjust it like it doesn't come out of the shareholder's pocket. It's ridiculous. So we have a renewed, a real renewed interest in gap earnings for that reason. Before we get into how you evaluate companies, I just wanted to ask one more thing on the idea generation side. I noticed on your website, you talk about that you do use 13 Fs a little bit. You know, you'll, you'll find some great managers you like, and you might use that as an idea generation. You know, what they're holding is something as a starting point for you to do your process. And I'm just wondering if you talk about how you do that. Well, I think the, the key there would be there are some really, really great investors out there. Um, and hopefully we've identified some that the entire industry is not looking at. And, uh, and we have, um, we have probably 10, 12 other money managers that aren't household names, but we just know they're damn smart and damn good. And so that's where it's really useful. It's not useful following Buffett. It's not useful following Ragman. And, 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 you know, the, the big names, um, where it's useful is, is, is identifying other managers that are really good and really smart, where you have a uh, great respect for their work. And that, that's where it's helpful. What is your main source of uncovering those managers? Are you, are you just reading and looking at other investment strategies and sort of like following them? And then over time, these are the managers that kind of rise to the top. Sure. It's all, it's, it's years of experience. Um, but it's funny. It's like, whenever I see a company that gets bought and I see, you know, a company gets bought for like a, a 300% return. The first thing I do is I look and see who owns it. And, uh, and, and at the, my first move is who owns it. And when I see, well, I go, damn, it's that guy again. It's like, God, he got another one. Right. <laughs> and where so he just he just goes higher and higher in your in your esteem because you've seen the you've seen you've seen he, he or she you know multiple times uh, be there and uh, that's just that's just one little one little way that I do it, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah yeah no it's uh it's uh we have we have our list of those that that we think are, are like I said um, that haven't made a whole lot of mistakes in their in their career. We all make mistakes, right? We all we all. We all regret some things that we've, that we've done investing. Um, but you know, if you're right, most of the time you do pretty good. One of the things I always like to talk about when we talk to qualitative managers is this idea of intrinsic value, because, you know, as quants, we don't really get into that, but I know a lot of people who dig die, who dive deep into companies do, and, and they get this intrinsic value and they look for sort of a margin of safety relative to that. And I, and I saw that was part of your process. So I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about 
how, how do you think about the process of calculating like the intrinsic value of a business? Well, you know, the intrinsic value is one of these things where it's, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's quite subjective. Um, but you know, there's any measure of return on invested capital, return on equity. I mean, uh, free cash flow, um, you know, any number of, of measures of the earnings ability of the company. Um, and then, and then you have to look at what, what does the company have a moat? Uh, um, how predictable are the future stream of earnings? And uh, all these things go into it. The balance sheet uh, is critical. Um, so there's a lot of things that it's almost like a baking a cake and all the ingredients that go into a cake and, and formulating intrinsic value. But there's no, you know, I think every, there are many different variations of determining intrinsic value, right? Once you, once you have a great business that you think you might want to invest in, how do, how do you think about valuation in your process? I mean, do you use some of the standard valuation metrics? Do you have some, some sort of a unique process you use? How, how do you think about valuation? Well, I mean, certainly we, we use the standard, the standard uh, valuations in the industry. But like I just said earlier about gap earnings and how very few people talk about gap earnings or look at gap earnings. And so I think that, uh, that's, we're much, much more uh, in tune with that, uh, much more in tune with, with, with the free cash flow generation of the company would be probably the, 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 the main, uh, the main, uh, coordinates of that. So just walk us through how it goes from like an idea to in the portfolio, because I know there's a team there. So I'm always, and Jack had mentioned before, we're a quantitative manager. So we're running models. The models are spitting out the changes and that's how we build investment strategies. I mean, I'm guessing for you and your team, you know, an idea is identified. And then is there like a discussion around the table about that particular name? And do you guys try to poke holes in the, in the thesis for those positions or like just how, how, how does it actually work? Sure. Yeah. So we have a four person investment team. Um, myself, Brian Lax, who's an, another portfolio manager and partner, my son, Joe and Chad Cook are the a four person team. Uh, uh, and we all generate ideas. Uh, typically, um, uh, it'll, it'll check one of the boxes and go onto our watch list and, and, and they'll be on the watch list for, but you know, it could be for a week or two months or six months. Uh, every once in a while, something goes like. It's in the portfolio with that day. Uh, um, and, 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 and so you never know. Um, I'm the CIO, so I make every final buy and sell decision. Um, except for one, we have our opportunity fund of Brian Lax runs and he makes all of those decisions. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'm making them, um, with a lot of input, uh, from, from the team. Uh, but I, uh, you know, I would say typically it goes on the watch list and then you just, you know, you're, you're checking news items every day, looking for new information, uh, trying to build your case as to why it belongs in the portfolio. It's not easy to get in our portfolio. We're concentrated. We don't have that many names. And so uh, typically, and we're, and we're normally fully invested. So often, I mean, so for something to get into the portfolio, usually you have to pick something out that, it's really tough sometimes to find something to sell. You referenced that you're pretty concentrated. How do you think about that balance between concentration and diversification? It's something we struggle with a lot. You know, we, we want to have the, the, you know, the most money possible in our highest conviction names. But we also understand, you know, we could be wrong. And we also understand investors need to be able to stick with the portfolio. And, and if we're too focused in one area, you know, that might be more difficult. So how do you think about that balance between concentrating in your biggest names, but also maintaining diversification? Yeah, we, we we're very comfortable being concentrated. Um, with the level of work that we do, um, and, and sometimes you see it as, it's just, it's just, it's a, just such a fat pitch, um, that we're fine making it a 10% position. Um, and that would be about as big as we get would be 10% in a, um, but, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I, that's, that's, that's how you make money, you know, in my mind, um, uh, I, but the people that, you know, that manage that have 250 names in the portfolio. Um, that they're just playing a different game than we are. Uh, and, uh, so we, you know, when we, some of the ideas, I like to make it bigger than 10% up to be honest with you. They're so, uh, the idea is so great. Um, uh, and, and, um, 
And yeah, we really, have, uh, very, very rarely have we been wrong on a big concentrator name in our portfolios. How about a sector and industry concentration? Will, will you also be aggressive there? If you, you know, if you think a particular sector is really attractive right now, will, will you put some limits on that or will you also make a big move into that? Well, that's hard. Um, it's hard right now for us because, uh, we're, 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 we're way, oh, I say overweight. I hate to use that term because that means that we're looking at some kind of an index, which we're not. Uh, but we're, you know, we're pretty heavily exposed to, to mining companies, uh, today. Uh, but this is a, a, a once in a, maybe a once in 50 year opportunity, this move, the clean energy movement and the metals necessary to get there. Uh, we, we really, I've never seen a greater opportunity than, than this right now. Um, so we're, you know, we're probably, you know, uh, towards a 40% in, in that area, uh, which I guess that, so then you sit there and say, but is that a sector? Or if you look at each of the commodities, are they not unique to themselves? So is there any connection, uh, between copper and silver? And, and I would say very little, uh, uh, one being a precious metal, one being an industrial metal, although copper also has industrial uses. So, um, uh, so I would say that we're, uh, but I would, back to your original question, I would say probably a 20% maximum to a sector, but, uh, but we have, uh, we've broken that, that rule, uh, today because I see a once in a, once in 50 year opportunity, uh, in, in these, um, in these metals, you know, everybody's driving a Tesla. I'm, I don't know where you guys live. I live in Southern California. I mean, there's just, there's EVs everywhere. And, and so is that a fad or is that, uh, here to stay? Um, as far as I can see, it's here to stay. Uh, I've been moved to EVs. Um, and I don't know if you know how much copper, there was 200 pounds of copper in every EV. Uh, hmm. and, and, you know, the, the, the demand for copper is supposed to double over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, no one knows where it's going to come from, but it's, it's, it's not out there. Um, and I, I, I so I think it, the, the only result would be higher prices, right? Uh, because the supply is not going to be there. So anyway, on there to your question, uh, of sector limitations. So I would say, I would answer it by saying 20%, except for that, uh, we've made, we, we've, we've, uh, we made an exception today because of the, um, huge, huge opportunity that we see. There's two things that I kind of want to tease out there. The first is, and you had said a few minutes ago that, uh, you know, you really don't have a benchmark um, because you're so, I guess, different and concentrated and so active. But how do you, what do you say to investors? I mean, how do you articulate that to your investors um, that, you know, the benchmark is, there really is no proper benchmark, but they're probably comparing you to something. So I'm just curious how, how you handle that up front. I mean, it's, it's hard. Uh, we're probably, probably the best with, I mean, we're, we're definitely more into small names than large cap names. So I would say the Russell 2000 is more applicable than the, than the S&P 500. Uh, uh, but, uh, but really we just tell people we're here to make money and, uh, right. and don't give a damn about benchmark weightings, oh, overweight, underweight. We just could care less. Uh, we're just trying to make money in a risk adjusted way. So that would be the answer. Yeah, no. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, that's great. And you know, if, if you can get those right investors on the bus, then they're going to, you know, be there with you into the strategy, into the portfolio, even during the times it might struggle a little bit. So, um, and the other thing I wanted to, and this goes back to, um, sort of this opportunity that you're seeing in some of these metals, but you, in one of your presentations, you referenced like the FANG 2.0 stocks, Bank of America is like FANG 2.0, which weren't the FANG stocks, the Facebooks, the Amazon, the Apples, the Netflix, the Googles that have dominated the market over the last 15 years. They had kind of put forward this thesis of a different type of, different types of stocks that would benefit from these secular changes um, over the next decade. And, and you thought that your portfolio was, you know, positively positioned to benefit from some of those trends. So can you just talk to what some of those might be? Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I've talked about the, the, the mining of commodities, um, uh, 
clearly, uh, we have a, a big stake in a company, Bungie, uh, symbol BG is one of the four big ag, uh, dealers in the world. They don't grow anything, but they handle, you know, corn and soybeans and wheat. And, and so what's interesting is a lot of money managers just don't like investing in commodities. Uh, and, um, I understand why, because it's hard enough to get the valuation of the company, right? Let alone worry about the price of the commodity. Right. And so I, I totally get that at the same time. Um, these commodities are just an essential part of the economy. Uh, the world doesn't turn without them. And so, so they're going to be used, they're going to be eaten, they're going to be consumed. Somebody has to do it. And so maybe it's my ag background that makes, makes me not shy from them. Like a lot of money managers, um, I don't shy from them and I, I don't, I don't have a bias either way. Happy to get involved. Um, and so, um, I think, but yeah, I think between ag and, 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 um, industrial metals and precious metals, we haven't talked about gold yet, you know, but, uh, and that's the other thing I want also on sector limitations and commodities, I would almost, I would, I would not almost, I would argue you need to back out gold and, and, ha and hold gold as a standalone, uh, uh, sector because it's, 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 it's a currency, uh, it, it's a hedge, uh, it, it's many things, uh, that I think should be carved out as a standalone. So you think gold, gold stocks or gold, like gold, the actual precious metal? Well, we don't have, we don't have an edge and, and just, and all of our investing, we don't have an edge in only the commodity itself. It's right. about companies. Okay. Is we have to, if you're going to own a gold miner, I mean, it has to go back to our process of great owner manager run companies, great balance sheets. Um, you know, the, our edge is identifying the best company, uh, both for quantitative and qualitative reasons. So it's, it's all about companies. And okay. And is the long term is overall, like, I'm not, I, I'm not that familiar with gold companies. Like we own, we own gold in some of our portfolios, but it's just GLD through like the ETS. Right. Um, and we, we have it mostly as a hedge and somewhat, you know, hopefully an inflation hedge. Um, and we'll talk about inflation in a minute, but you know, just generally like the gold business is most of the demand, like jewelry based. Is that what, where most of the gold demand is coming from? No, it's mostly, um, central banks buying okay. it, um, you know, Russia, the, the Chinese, China, Japan, the U S I mean, the central banks around the world are huge owners of gold, huge. And, um, and, and. And I, I want to say, I saw recently where China is sitting on a couple of trillion dollars of gold in the, uh, in the central <laughs> bank. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that would be, I mean, cons Indian consumers, Chinese, they, they, they they buy a lot of gold for, for, uh, for, uh, you know, wearables, but no, I, I would say the vast majority is central bank. Yeah. And I think after what happened with, uh, you know, Russia and their financial system with the U.S. sanctions and stuff. I think the idea was that, you know, more and more countries were going to get more, even more behind gold because if their financial system could be shut off from the dollar, you know, they want to have those assets on their, the gold assets, if you will, on their balance sheets, which might further drive, I guess, the demand for gold long term. Sure. Also, I should add central bank and also invest, investor like GLD uh, is, 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 is also a huge part of it. How do you think about um, inflation? So, you know, we've, we were in a period from 1980 to basically 2020 where inflation was basically declining, interest rates were falling. Uh, but, you know, some people think we're, we've certainly seen a much higher inflation over the last few years. You know, where it ends up, where it finally settles in, you know, is still to be determined. But how do you think about building a portfolio in, you know, potentially higher inflationary times? Or does that not really come into the process because you're so company specific? It doesn't, it doesn't really come into our thinking, but I take comfort in the fact that equities do well during inflationary times, uh, that, that does give me comfort. Uh, um, but, uh, but no, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm, mean, it, it, it appears it's, it, it's, it's going to be here for a while. It's not going away. It's, it, I believe the worst is behind us, but it seems that we're stuck in this between four and 5%. Which is double what, what anybody wants. 
Um, and I think it's going to be sticky for a, for a long time for, for many reasons. Uh, but no, it doesn't really come into our thinking in terms of mm-hmm. talks. Going back to what you mentioned earlier, one of the things that's really unique about you guys is, you know, we, we tend to talk to long only managers, but you also do run some portfolios where you're shorting. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what is the process like for that? How do you determine what a good short candidate? Sure. And, and there had been some great ones over the years. Um, my, my, my favorite story was, is, um, is Blockbuster. And the think back, and we're all old enough for every blockbuster in their, in their prime. And they run every street corner. And everybody, you know, was going to blockbuster and standing in line and renting a movie and buying popcorn. And, and they were hugely <laughs> successful. And I just kept seeing that the selling was just like I'd never seen before in my life. Just massive insider selling. And... I know what happened. They're probably at the lunch table one day and they go, there's Netflix, you're up as Netflix with their, you know, their overnight movie in the mail. And, and, and that was before streaming. But, you know, I mean, within a matter of years, Blockbuster is gone just from, from, you know, what, 80 to zero. Um, so yeah, it, it, our shorting would, would leave with, itself, with massive insider selling. I mean, I mean, massive. And, uh, and then I, you know, look at valuation, right? Typically the stock would be at an all time high and insiders are bailing as fast as we saw it again at Le- in Leopard Liquidator about, uh, about eight years ago. Um, saw it recently with Dollar General. Um, see where massive insider selling stock at an all time high. And then I always look to see what the short interest is. And typically in these stocks that are so low, insiders are bailing. And there's virtually nobody short the stock. So you're not going to get caught in a squeeze. Uh, a highly leveraged balance sheet. So you just, you just check all the boxes and check, 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 check. And it's like, we'll short that. And um, pretty hard to get hurt when the stock's trading at an all time high and insider for bailing. But when you see it, it's a pretty tough pit. It's funny on Blockbuster. I think like until recently, there was one Blockbuster store left in the U.S. I think it was like in Alaska or something, right? But I think, I think Close. I just read that maybe they shut Close. that down too. So there might not be any left. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but it was pretty amazing to watch. You know, I mean, I, I grew up going to Blockbuster every weekend and, you know, to, to watch like Netflix take over and to watch it evaporate was pretty interesting to watch on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't, we don't do a lot of short, um, but, but, you know, it's, it's a way to add incremental value to the portfolio when you see it. And, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it's gratifying when it works. You mentioned not getting caught in the squeezes. What are the unique things you have to think about from a risk perspective? Like, I'm sure you weren't short GameStop, but like the guys that were short GameStop had to be very, very careful, even if they had a very, very small position yeah. because it got no. so out of control. Like, how do you think no about in- risk management on the short side? I have no interest in that. No interest. You know, anything that's, anything that's talked about, you have no interest in Right, it has to be. It has to be where everybody loves it. Nobody shorted. Um, the sky's blue as far as you can see, but insiders are dumping their stock. You know, and and, uh, and it's amazing how the media doesn't 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 catch that or follow up on that. It's amazing. A lot of times you see people interviewed on TV and they're shorting their stock at the same time they're being interviewed. Yeah, you th- it almost sounds illegal, doesn't it? And uh, they're saying things are great, things are great. And they're selling their stock, and so. Uh, yeah, no, we, any of the meme stocks and being, all of those have just have no interest being involved. In closing, we like to ask all of our guests sort of one standard closing question. And that is based on your experience in the markets and maybe even life in general, if you could impart one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? I would say it would be, why would you want to own a company where people at the company aren't excited about owning their own stock? Uh, just pure and simple. Um, uh, You want to invest in something where the people that work there actively want to own more, uh, because they see value. And, uh, you know, uh, I've always thought that, uh, I found this out at a, at a young age in investing that people in the boardroom know about, know more about the company than anybody else. And, uh, the way the business works is people give great credence to a wall street firm's research. And their opinion of the stock, um, in our opinion, people in the boardroom might do no more. And, uh, and so that's where we take our lead. 
Well, thank you very much for your time today, Joe. If people want to learn more about you, Old West, where can they go? Yeah. Um, you know, our website, uh, oldwestim.com. Uh, and uh, you know, call us. We're here to we answer our phone. We're here to talk about what, what we do. Um, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we're, we're, we're building a, you know, a company for the long run. We're 15 years old. Um, and, uh, gaining new friends all the time and, uh, having fun doing it. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Good luck to you guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of excess returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practical quant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.